to uh, have Elise here, uh, Elise Ford. And so, go ahead. Thanks. Um, great. Yeah. So I'm Elise Ford. Um, I'm a graduate student at Stanford. I'm very excited to be here uh, kicking off this conference this week. I'm super excited to be following up on what John just talked about. There's going to be some overlap um, in some of the things we were talking about. Um, we've been collaborating for a while on the DESI Low Z survey, um, which I'm going to talk about some in this talk. It's a survey that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, but I also kind of just want to motivate more generally um, how we optimize target selection for low redshift galaxies. Cool. So, yeah, kind of the inciting question and something you know, John kind of brought up in his talk as well is given a region of sky, you know, how do we select targets um, to efficiently run both a complete and pure low redshift survey? Um, so before we get started on that, you know, we might just want to motivate. Why would we even be interested in a complete and pure low redshift survey? Um, so there are a number of science cases um, for having really a dense survey of the low redshift universe. Um, so this includes looking at the efficiency of galaxy formation, feedback at small scales. Um, you also get a really nice catalog for identifying transients and gravitational wave hosts. You can use satellite kinematics to estimate scatter in the galaxy halo connection. Um, and you can also start to place studies of Milky Way dwarf galaxies in a more cosmological context. Um, so all of that's really exciting, um, but in order to do that, you have to actually run your survey. Um, so the problem. Um, so one problem is that these low redshift objects are vastly outnumbered by higher redshift galaxies. Um, so at an apparent magnitude of less than 20, there are approximately 1,000 objects per square degree, and we really only expect about 10 of them to be low redshift. Um, here I'm going to call low redshift as z of less than 0.03. You can kind of pick your favorite number um, between about 0.01 and 0.1, um, depending on exactly what you're interested in. This is the redshift target for the desi z survey, and so it's kind of the redshift target I will be talking about. Um, but yeah, the, you can think of this as somewhat of a range. Um, and then, so yeah, so at r of less than 20, only 10 out of 1,000 objects we expect to be at this lower redshift. And this only gets worse as you go to fainter magnitudes, where you get even more and more dwarfed by higher redshift objects. Um, so uh, we are imagine that you know this is some patch of sky, and you're trying to pick out your 10 low redshift objects um, out of this patch of sky. I don't actually know if this was one by one square degree, so maybe there are 10. Um, so a lot of you here, I'm sure, have looked at images of galaxies for a long time. Um, you know, John put up a picture very similar to this one and, you know, was saying, can you pick out the low redshift galaxies here? And I imagine some of you were like, yeah, I think I can, you know? Um, and, you know, I've been working with low redshift objects for a while as well now, too, now. Um, and I also feel like, you know, I've started to gain an intuition for what, which of these objects are actually low redshift, right? So you might say, all right, you know, I can set, kind of see the disk up here. That object's probably pretty low redshift. Over here, this is a really nice looking dwarf galaxy. That's that's probably low redshift. That's pretty classical looking. Not exactly sure what this kind of fuzzy blue object is, but yeah, probably low redshift as well, right? So, you know, we can actually do this pretty well by eye. You know, historically people have done a lot of this work by eye. But that brings us to the second problem, which is that, you know, we're now running surveys like DESI, right? Where we're covering tens of thousands of square degrees in the sky. And that means that even if we only have 10 objects per square degree, we're looking at over, you know, 100,000 targets. Um, and that really means that target selection by eye is not effective anymore, right? We cannot cover the areas of the sky that we want to cover selecting targets manually. So we're going to have to select them algorithmically. Um, there's been a lot of work that has gone into algorithmic um, target selection just using photometry. Um, but unfortunately, most photometric um, redshift algorithms have been optimized for higher redshifts, have been thought about in the cosmological context. And these algorithms are really, really good at what they do, but they just have not been optimized um, for selecting these lowest redshift objects. Um, so you can see here, this is an example from um, the first Saga paper, um, looking at the Saga satellites um, using a photometric redshift algorithm. And you see you get a lot of scatter here, right? It's, it's not able to really accurately um, give you redshifts for these very low redshift objects. Um, so this 
brings me to Saga. Um, John talked a little bit about Saga 2. Um, Saga is the Satellites Around Galactic Analog Survey. Um, the goal was to observe satellite galaxies around 100 Milky Way analogs um, out to about 40 megaparsecs. And in order to achieve this, Saga you know, had to really take a stab at solving this problem, at saying, OK, we cannot target everything in the sky around our host galaxies, so how do we start to select objects that we think are likely to be satellite galaxies? Um, and a lot of work has gone into this um, by the Saga team. Um, and they really did uh, develop some cuts, um, some photometric cuts that were surprisingly impressively accurate um, at selecting these lowest redshift objects. So they identified a set of color and surface brightness cuts optimized for low redshift galaxy selection. And these cuts give you about 100 objects per square degree. So it's down by about a factor of 10 from just random selection. Um, and the Saga team really verified them to be very complete out to about Z of 0.01, um, and the sample peaks at about Z of 0.1. Um, and so this is already, you know, really getting you ahead of just the limit of saying, throwing up your hands and saying, I have no idea how to select low redshift doctorate. So of course, as John kind of spoiled, you know, there, there's information in these images, right? Like we can do this by eye. And as soon as you can look at an image and say something about it by eye, you know, everyone here who's done any machine learning, I'm sure, you know, is thinking, all right, well, images, we know how to do them, right? Um, so this, of course, is ImageNet. It's a benchmark image classification data set. Um, and it contains over 14 million images split into 20,000 categories. And modern convolutional neural network techniques can achieve incredibly high accuracy on this, right? And so, you know, if we can do it with this crazy large data set, you know, we can probably do it with dwarf galaxies, right? Um, and as John spoiled, yes, we can. Um, so this is the same picture that John showed. Um, showing a CNN predicting um, low versus high redshift galaxies. Um, so this all brings me to the Low-Z survey. Um, so Low-Z is a DESI secondary target survey. Um, the goal is to select low redshift targets. So again, here, Z of less than 0.03, um, between R of 1921, using this combination of photometric and machine learning methods. So we're using the Saga photometric cuts and then on top of that, um, we're using this convolutional neural network that John trained to kind of uh, super select some of those targets for higher priority. Um, and then kind of beyond this, we want to understand best practices for future low redshift surveys. Um, so Saga is a really great survey. I'm really excited about it, but it is a secondary target survey. Um, that means it basically just gets to use spare fibers um, on a DESI um, imaging, patch of imaging. Um, and it's lower priority than basically everything else, right? So um, we're getting bumped anytime there is a cosmological target in the field. Um, and so that means that even though, you know, we have a, tar a lot, a lot of targets per square degree, about 300, um, you know, we're really only able to get like fiber allocation for about 30% of that. Um, despite all that, Lozi already has a lot of redshifts. Um, so Lozi already has redshifts for over 100,000 targets. This is actually an old number. This is just using about the first few months of DESI data. Since then, we've had about a year more of data taken. Um, so there are a lot of um, Lozi objects that have already been observed. Um, on the right here, you can just see this distribution of redshifts for um, this early Lozi sample. Um, so Low-Z is split into different tiers. The main thing that uh, you guys should focus on here is this orange tier. So those are the CNN-selected objects. Um, and you can see that while the other tiers peak at about 0.01, um, as expected from the results from the Saga survey, um, the CNN-selected tier is peaking at much lower redshift, so about Z of 0.05. Um, that just shows how good um, these CNN techniques are really at selecting these lowest redshift objects. Um, over here, you know, we can look at a distribution of our stellar mass. Um, so blue and green here is gamma and SDSS DR8. Um, the black line was this early low-Z survey, and then the gray shaded region is projected after our full um, Y5 uh, DESI is complete. Um, and as you can see, you know, we really expect to have an order of magnitude more of these uh, lowest mass galaxies just from low-Z as a secondary target survey. Um, so again, I think really exciting. Um, the sample it's producing is going to be really exciting. Um, but, you know, 
thinking about going forward, you know, we want to understand how good is our target selection, especially if we want to run a similar survey, but at larger scales um, at higher priority. Um, so I've kind of split this discussion into purity and completeness. So starting with purity. Um, so kind of reframing this is what are the odds that a galaxy in our sample um, is low redshift. So again, you know, we have this number from random selection. It's about 0.1%. Um, we can pull in our photometric selections. Um, so again, that brings us down uh, to about 1% to 2%. And then we can fold in our CNN selection and we'll get to 20%. Um, I think this increase is really impressive. We were really excited to see these numbers. So, you know, this means one in five of the objects that we're getting redshifts for that are CNN selected are actually um, low redshift objects. Of course, you know, purity is not the only thing we care about. We also care about completeness. So um, what are we missing when we do this, uh, our target selection? Um, and so again, kind of reframing this is how many objects at redshift less than 0.03 are not in our sample. Um, so Desi observed about 3,000 objects at Z of less than 0.03. Um, obviously, there's a caveat here using Desi data. You know, a lot of these lowest redshift objects are already low Z targets. Um, you can see that here. So about two-thirds of them were low Z targets to begin with. Um, but there are some um, objects that are observed uh, at this, these low redshifts that are outside of the low Z sample. Um, so we wanted to investigate, you know, what these objects, what are these objects, what are we missing? Um, so out of the remaining about a thousand objects, about half of them, um, it turns out, were just junk. Um, it's not real junk, but they're shreds of larger galaxies, right? And so you, the photometry is wrong because you're really just getting a very small piece of a large slow redshift galaxy. Um, besides that, there are another about 400 objects that were um, within our photometric cuts, but just removed by other um, cleaning cuts we were applying to the photometric catalog. Um, and we've actually updated some of these cleaning cuts um, as uh, low Z goes into year two. Um, but that means that only about 97, so about 3%, were actually out of side of the low Z photometric cuts. Um, so this is really exciting to see. Um, showing that low Z really, at least, you know, with this target sample, was achieving um, greater than 95% completeness um, for these very low redshift objects. Cool. Um, also, you know, looking at the CNN, um, so we retrained the CNN using our Y1 sample um, and then looked at, you know, how complete the CNN predictions were. Um, for the tr CNN without retraining, you know, it's already doing very, very well. Um, but, and we bump it up a little bit, um, retraining with some of this early data. Um, and we're really able to achieve greater than 95% completeness um, with about 100 objects per square degree. Um, of course, you know, this is kind of the bad news caveat. Um, complete photometric selection uh, cannot always guarantee a complete sample. So even if we're selecting these objects very completely, um, other things come in when you actually are trying to get redshifts. Um, and one problem here is um, for some of these low surface brightness dwarf galaxies, um, they have very, very low fiber magnitudes. It's actually very hard to get accurate redshifts. Um, so on, here on the right, this is a plot of CNN probability as a function of fiber magnitude. Um, and then it's colored by redshift failure rates. Um, and so you can see that as you go to fainter fiber magnitudes, you generically are getting, you know, more redshift failures. But, you know, even more concerningly, as you go to higher CNN probability, you're getting more redshift failures. Um, these are some of the images of some of these objects that we were unable to get redshifts for. Um, and part of the reason is that the CNN is really selecting these very diffuse, very large, slow redshift galaxies. Um, and those are just galaxies that it turns out are hard to get redshifts for. Um, and so this is something always to like keep in the back of your mind that, you know, when you're talking about complete selection, you can have complete selection and then still have um, instrumental challenges in actually getting a complete sample at the end. Um, however, you know, all that aside, um, I think this is still really, really an exciting sample, an exciting survey. Excited to see um, it going forward. So Lozi is going to continue for the remainder of the DESI um, five-year survey. Um, and then going forward, you know, we made some predictions just based off of this early data. Um, and so we think that, you know, just using our photometric cuts, um, we can run a complete redshift survey out to 0.03 with about 350 targets per square degree 
um, for our of less than 21, about 800 targets per square degree of our of less than 22. Um, this would be complete uh, at these redshifts um, to a stellar mass of above 10 to the 7. So that's really exciting. Um, again, though, with the caveat that some of these objects are going to be very diffuse and very faint, and it may be very hard to get um, actual to get redshifts for them. Um, and then adding in CNN selection can reduce these target densities probably by upwards of factor of three. Um, yeah, so just to conclude, so combining traditional photometric selections with modern machine learning techniques, um, we can achieve really complete and pure low redshift target selection. Um, Lozi is already kind of showing the power of the selection, and I think, you know, it's a really exciting sample for anyone who's already interested in um, doing low redshift science with some of these objects. Um, but in the future, we really hope that, you know, we will be able to expand a survey like this um, to densely map the nearby universe. Uh, yeah, so happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liz. So. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. It's really impressive the gains you can get by including the morphological information. Um, I just had a question. Have you thought at all about how you can impose this selection function on simulation data? Um, like, so theoretically, how you can study how the effect of this more complicated selection function will affect power spectrum measurements and, and things like that on a cosmological volume? Yeah, no, I don't. That isn't something we've thought about too much. Um, I mean, I guess, so the question... Are you asking, like, could we build mock images to try and, like, run CNN selection? On, right. Or yeah. On no, Z that's mocks or something. Yeah. an interesting question, but not something that we've tried to do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm Matt, <laughs> Matt Ho. Yeah, that's my name. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Wormsley. Um, great talk. Just kind of a slightly simpler version of the same question. Do you find that the CNNs and the photometry pick out different kinds of galaxies? And if so, how are they different? And I appreciate the completeness point, but presumably the improved density comes from, you know, choosing not to sample some things you otherwise might have. So I'm just curious how that plays in. You're asking differences between CNN selection and photometric selection. That's right. Yeah, so currently what we're doing is the CNN's only selecting within the photometric cuts. Um, so you're not really going to see a difference um, between the two selection. It really is like, what are you choosing to cut out? Right. Um, but, but as you cut out some things from that, you'll change the distribution of things you do pick, right? Yes. Yeah. So the CNN um, really does tend to prioritize these very blue um, diffuse objects pretty much in line, you know, with what we would expect. And I would say like that that's like, you know, to highest order, the differences that you see. Um, but I, the CNN doesn't just select these types of objects. So it probably would be interesting to like really dip, try and dig down into, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, next questions? Hi, thanks. Uh, Dalia Baron, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a somewhat more general question. Uh, since you're interested in very low Z galaxies, I was wondering if I could give you the ability of design your, of designing your own filters. Would you design them differently from the filters of Desi to increase uh, your uh, chances of uh, finding uh, low Z galaxies? Yeah, that's an interesting question and something that I am not enough of an observer um, to have a good answer for, but yeah, very <laughs> uh, Definitely yes. I mean, you know, there are some medium or narrowband filters that are quite helpful. Um, there is an example of this, um, the Marion survey, which has actually explicitly designed some filters to find dwarf galaxies uh, between redshift 0.05 and point one, and so far it's looking quite successful. We've tried to focus on slightly lower redshift than that. But yeah, I mean, I think if you know what your goal is, designing those filters is quite effective. And what is the probability of that? Is here one in Yeah, I actually don't know the answer off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
So we have a question here, right? Louise Edwards, um, I really appreciated your discussion of uh, pure and complete target selection versus pure and complete target sample at the end of the day. And I get, I'm wondering if uh, for, for situations like in the bottom row, second to last, can you get a spectrum for something like that that has something else that looks like it's sort of almost right in there? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, you are gonna get run into issues with blending. Um, Something that we found with DESI is that you can sometimes mitigate this when, you know, the redshift that the DESI like pipeline is predicting really doesn't match with your photometric criteria or really doesn't match with your CNN probability. Um, and so we have gone back and tracked down some objects where that seems like something's off. And often when we look at them, it's something like this, where uh, it's a blended object and the redshift pipeline is picking up on the higher redshift object. Um, but you know, of course, that you don't you don't know that you're tracking down all of them, um, and it is definitely you know an issue I think in general, right? You know, once we're getting samples that are way larger than is easy to check by eye, there are things that are yeah going to go under the radar. Um, Just to add on to this exact statement, it's a really funny vignette moment that I just want to relate to this community is. When John first did this work, trying to prove that he could replicate Saga, he missed one object. And then we went back and looked at that object, and it was wrong. <laughs> and it was, I mean, this is very early with very small subset of Saga data. It's not perfect anymore. But that was just such a funny moment of like, oh, I have never actually seen a machine learning uh, you know, thing fix the training set, um, which is exactly what happened. So it's exactly the same thing, um, but in, a, in an earlier iteration. I'm Josh Peak still. I'm so sorry. Um, so, Chaitakure, um, so I just want to clarify uh, what you're trying to predict with the CNN. Are you trying to predict uh, and solve the classification problem? Or are you like predicting redshift or some sort of priority function and trying to select through that? Yeah. So, we're trying to solve a classification problem. Um, yeah, so basically we're just trying to select a sample that we think is actually low redshift with some probability. Um, and then, yeah, we have some cut on that probability. The CNN's probability that this is a low redshift object or not low redshift. Okay, thanks. He, he said. <laughs> uh, any questions on Zoom? Okay, so we have uh, time for Hi, just uh, yeah, just Sarkmer. Um, I wanted to come back to Peter's question to John. Um, so, do you have a sense of completeness and purity uh, for satellites and field bars? Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, honestly, I would be more concerned on the satellite side, potentially, just because, you know, the photometric selection really is prioritizing bluer objects, right? Um, and so we don't think we're missing things that are quenched, but, you know, possibly there's some really exotic objects that we're not seeing there. Um, I, but... Yeah, I don't have a strong sense that there would be a very like differential completeness between the two. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, this is an interesting case because actually the the our initial training set was uh, very heavily weighted towards satellite galaxies um, from Saga because that that was the thing. But but you know there are enough you know. Things in the outskirts of Saga look basically just like the field. So I would say satellites were overweighted in the initial training set, but uh, I think we still spanned the full range. As far as I can tell, the completeness is, is identical for, for both uh, sample sets. And, um, you know, it's, as Elise highlighted, right, in Desi Lozi, we're, we actually have two separate selections. We have the CNN selection and we have this Photometric selection, which was designed by our Saga data, which is basically 100% complete. 
And so, um, I, you know, it does not appear that we're missing anything significantly um, for the, you know, for the ones that actually get selected. Just so I can, I can imagine that it does have a different effect on the on the completeness of the sample. What has a different effect? Sorry. Whether whether there are satellites versus uh, field dwarfs. That there's a different effect on the completeness. Yeah, because you're because you're affected by the magnitudes in the fiber, by blending, by. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you know, when we did track down some of these objects that weren't in our sample, um, it is true that a lot of them were in super dense regions um, where these satellites look somewhat different um, than they do in the field, actually. And so, like, those were objects. Like, a lot of those 97 objects were in the coma cluster. Um, so there's an issue there. There is also an issue with, you know, just fiber collisions in dense regions. How many fibers are actually getting? Um, one of the like weirdly nice things about the way low Z is run is that it, so it's a dark time survey. Most of the other low redshift surveys in DESI are bright time surveys. And so that actually means that even though we are, you know, getting limited fiber allocation, it shouldn't really be competing with other like dense low redshift regions. Um, and so that I think like gives us kind of a leg up in very dense regions, um, because we should at least be getting about the same number of, um, fibers. Uh, but yeah, you know, there will be differences there as well. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, um, so yeah, just as a follow-up, I think um, what, probably the bigger challenge at this point is the observational incompleteness, right? The spectroscopic failures are really creating in particular a bias, right? Um, because you don't have emission lines, so you, you know, if it's too diffuse, these kinds of things make it really hard to confirm this. Um, I think with XSOC, uh, you can look at the parent selection. Uh, so what I had showed, I, I didn't have time to show it, but you can actually use clustering based redshift techniques. I think there was some mention of like, we'll do power spectrum, uh, you know, comparison show. And you actually end up basically with all power in the lowest redshift band based off of like what you know, other techniques have done. because. We literally are redefining the sample of the lowest redshift part. We should be the calibration part at this point moving forward. And so if you compare against Sloan, though, it's still like all the power that the lowest redshift, you know, the clustering is indicative of that. And there's very, very little contamination elsewhere, uh, you know, if, if the field gets. But what does that look like in terms of like cluster galaxy population? It's probably a little messy, but I, I think that's typically true with any spectroscopic. Uh, we have time for one more question. So if not, let's, uh, thanks, Elise again. And then.